Hey everyone. In this chapter, we're talking about functions and we'll be graphing by hand. So we were taking a look at what kind of qualities functions have and we're looking to see when we have a function and when we don't. This is a common topic in all algebra classes, so you've probably heard it before in Algebra 1 and Algebra 2. Uh, we're doing it again here in Algebra 3 as well. So here's the official definition. And to kind of help explain what you're seeing here, I'm summarizing it in a couple of different ways. So on the left-hand side, this is the summary that explains what we're talking about here. We're saying each input has exactly one output. What we're concerned about is that every input is used, and when you take that input and you plug it into your equation, you're looking at how many answers do you get. You have to have exactly one answer. If you're getting two answers, it's not a function. We're representing that here with the diagrams that you see on the right-hand side. We're saying a function is from set A to set B. So there's a certain relation, and that relation is describing what you plug in and what you get out as an answer. So every, we call these elements, so every element, every input must be used. And so the idea is I'm going to take all of my inputs, we're going to plug them into my equation, my function, and out comes one specific answer. All right, so here I'm just kind of pairing them up. This is the relation that uh, it's describing here in the definition. Notice that there are some extra numbers in this range that are not being used. That's okay. We don't have to use every single output. We have to use every input. So that's why it says each input and each input is paired up with exactly one output. If we were to draw the diagram in such a way that we would have, for example, this input of 2 paired up with an output of 8 and a 15, well, then it's no longer a function because we have to have exactly one output. So that's what this is talking about here. Set A is your set of inputs, which is your domain, and set B is your outputs, which is the range. Now, when we're talking about inputs, we're also wanting to make sure that we get real answers. We don't want imaginary answers. We want to collect all of the numbers that result in real answers, not imaginary answers, and that will be our domain. There are some qualities of these functions. Each element of A, so again, the element is the individual thing that you see inside this bubble here. Each element of set A must be matched with an element of B. That means one element of B. That's what the arrows are showing. Some elements of B may not be matched. You can see there's some extra numbers floating around that are not paired up. That's okay here. In part three, it says two or more elements of A may be matched with the same element of B. I didn't draw that diagram, but let's say, for example, that we had one paired up to seven and let's change the path so that 2 is also paired up with 7. That's okay. You can have the same output. You can have the same answer. The question is, how many answers are we getting? We want exactly one answer, even if it's the same answer every time. So what we're going to look at some of those details in, in uh, these examples down here at the bottom of the page. There's different ways to represent this. Here we have a table of data. These are what we call braces. They show set notation. So these are sets. These are collections of numbers. These are all the inputs. These are all the outputs. What we're doing is we're just grouping them in this way. And I rewrote the set of inputs and the set of, set of outputs. So we had ordered pairs. So you take the four, you're plugging it into some equation, and out comes an answer of seven. So you can think of it like an x-coordinate and a y-coordinate. There we have our pairs. And the question is, do we have a function or not? We have 4 comma 7, 3 comma 2, negative 1 comma 8, 5 comma negative 3, and 3 comma negative 9. Does that show a pattern of a function? No, it doesn't, and this is the reason why. This is not a function because the input of 3 has two outputs, meaning it has two answers. And we don't want two different answers. That's really confusing. It's like there's this equation, and I plug in 3, and out comes a 2. Oh, wait a minute. No, out comes a negative 9. Which is it? It's both. Well, I don't know what my answer is supposed to be, right? We just want one answer at a time. So if you have the same input 
showing where you have two different outputs, that violates our definition of a function. Here in example B, again, we have a table, same idea. There's your input, there's your output. So 2 comma 11, 2 comma 10, 3 comma 8, 4 comma 5, 5 comma 1. Is this a function? Again, this is not a function for the same reason we saw earlier. I'm plugging in 2, but I'm getting two different outputs. We only want one output. So this is not a function. Right below that here in example 1 part C, this is what we call a mapping diagram. And uh, we again have our inputs, that's the domain, and this is our range, that's our set of outputs. So you can see we're taking this negative 2, we're plugging it into an equation, and out comes the answer of 3. Negative 1 is our uh, input, and the output is 3 as well. We plug in 0, the output is 4. So that's how we're reading it. Those are your inputs, that's your output. That's the pairing. The question is, do we have a function? And the answer is yes, this is a function. And uh, oftentimes we get tripped up on how these arrows are pointing to the same number. There's no problem with that. You're allowed to have the same answer. The question is how many different answers do you have? When I'm plugging in a negative 2, I'm getting exactly one output. That's what we want. So this pattern that you see here is described in uh, this middle box up at the top of the page here. Point number three, two or more elements, think of those as inputs, of set A may be matched with the same output of B. So that's what we're seeing in that mapping diagram. So just by, <clears throat> excuse me, just by way of contrast, let's take a look at another mapping diagram. Here my domain is negative two, negative one, positive one with an output of five, four, three, and two. If I were to do this, that's not a function, right? Because I cannot plug in my input and have two different answers. That's what you would be looking for. So if, you are, if your arrows are pointing to the same output, that's okay. If your arrows are pointing to two different outputs, that is not a function. And to go a little bit farther with the same mapping diagram, let's say I plug in positive one, I get an answer of three, but let's say I, I don't plug this one in. That is, if I were to plug it in, I would have like no output, There's like maybe an imaginary number. That would also prevent it from being a function. So this is also an issue. If I plugged in negative one and there's no output because there's no arrow being drawn to indicate that there's any sort of answer, I have to have an answer, but if I'm not getting an answer, that means I'm getting an imaginary number. So this would also say, hey, there's, we're not using every input. So that's why we say each input must be used. Each input has to have exactly one output. When you are plotting points on a Cartesian coordinate system, it's in, in uh, communicating inputs and outputs, right? So I plug in a two and out comes an answer of three, or I plug in a one, and out comes an answer of zero, or I plug in a zero, and out comes an answer of negative one. Notice we're getting exactly one y-coordinate, one output for every one of those inputs. Notice with these two points, we have the same output. We have the same y-coordinate, and that's okay. Each input has to have exactly one output. So yeah, that is a function as well. So that's topic number one, just determining if we have a function or not based upon the numbers that we have in our sets or in our diagrams. Now we're moving on to topic number two, which is instead of looking at collections of numbers, let's take a look at an equation itself. Up at the top of the next page, we want to determine algebraically whether y is a function of x. This is a key phrase we're going to be encountering this whole chapter. When it says y is a function of x, that means solve for y. So think of it as y equal sign, and this is everything else on the other side, whether it's the equation of a line or the equation of a, of a, you know, of a parabola, whatever it is, y is by itself. The function is the equal sign, and everything else is on the right-hand side with the input of x. Right? That's what this means here, y in terms of x. Think of that as y in terms of is your equal sign, and everything else on the right-hand side is there because you got y by itself. That's what we have to do here as well. Let's solve for y and see what happens. 
I'm going to subtract the 3x from both sides, so negative 2y squared equals a negative 3x plus 4. Dividing away the negative 2, so we have a y squared equals positive 3 has x and a minus 2. Lastly, to get rid of that power of 2, we'll take the square root of both sides. Don't forget your plus or minus right there. So y equals plus or minus square root of 3 halves x minus 2. So this is step one. First, if it's not already set up so that y is by itself, you have to turn your equation so y is a function of x. But the question is, is it a function? You have to figure that out. The question is, how many answers do we get? If I put in a number, like let's plug in 20. I'm going to plug in 20. How many answers do I get? Well, because of the plus or minus, that means I have two answers. And if I have two answers, it's not a function. So notice the difference between an equation and a function. This is an equation because of the equal sign. But not all equations are functions. So functions are special kinds of equations that behave in certain ways. This is not behaving like a function, but it is behaving like an equation. Let's contrast that with this next example, 3b. We have 4x squared plus 8y equals 3. Let's solve for y. So 8y equals negative 4x squared plus 3. Dividing away the 8, so y equals a negative 1 half x squared plus 3 over 8. So y is in terms of x. The question is it in, as a function of x, and we're just looking for a plus or minus sign. We see the minus sign, but there's no plus or minus sign. So that means when you plug in a number, you will get exactly one answer. So yes, this is a function. So all you're really doing is just looking to see if you have a plus or minus sign or not. So that's topic number two. Topic number three here is talking about function notation and evaluating the function at a certain value. So we often use x for the input, but it doesn't have to be x. But typically, we're going to use x for the input. And when we have the f with the parentheses around the x, this is not multiplication. We read this as f of x, or you could say f evaluated at x. And so what this is communicating is we're saying this notation is representing the answer, the output. But within that notation, you have the symbol that also communicates the input. So it's like the output and the input is being revealed at the same time. For example, let's evaluate the function f defined by, so here's the function. So notice it is an equation, but it's more than an equation. It's a special kind of equation because with this notation, they're telling us up front it is a function. That means you are guaranteed to get exactly one answer out. This is your answer. This is your input right there. So f of x squared, excuse me, 4x squared plus 2 is where we'll do the calculation. And so in part A, they're saying let's evaluate the function at 2. So f of 2 means 2 is your input. So wherever you see that letter x symbol, you're going to drop in a number 2 here and here. So that's 4 times 2 squared with a plus 2. So the answer is 18. And sometimes we'll take this and rewrite it again right down here so it's all on one line. So there's your input of 2. f of 2 equals 18. Notice it's just a different way of showing an ordered pair. If we were plotting the point, 2 would be the x-coordinate. 18 would be the y-coordinate, so there's your input and output as well. But this is showing the function notation. We're going to skip part B for now. We're actually going to focus on this kind of work exclusively on day three. So let me just say C 1.2 day three. We'll do a whole bunch of examples on that day of that type of problem. We're continuing with evaluating our function. Here we're using a different example. In example five, we have g of x equals negative x squared plus 4x plus 1. Now we can plug in a number just fine. What we're doing really is saying, what if it's not a number? What if you plug in another variable, like t? Or what if you plug in a combination of both, like this binomial of t plus 2? Let's look at each of these in turn. So for the first example, 2 is our input. We'll plug that in place of x. We see that here. We see that here. We see that here in the equation. That's where the input goes. So g of 2 equals negative 
2 squared plus 4 times 2 plus 1. And that gives us a result of positive 5. So g of 2 equals 5. So there's our output of 5. In the next part, we're not plugging in a number. We're plugging in just a different variable. We're plugging in t. Where does it go? Well, it goes wherever you see that x symbol. x is the symbol for input, so I'm going to plug it in here and here and here. So it looks like this. g of t equals negative t squared plus 4 times t plus 1. And there's really nothing to simplify here. There's no like terms, so that's as far as we can take it. Now, in the third part, we're going to plug in an entire binomial. So that grouping symbol is really handy because it helps us communicate not just the input, but that we have a binomial. So we have to plug it in as a bundle like this. Where do we plug in the binomial? Well, here and here and here as well. And then we'll simplify it. So g of t plus 2 equals negative. Here's my input squared. So there's the binomial that I'm dropping in. We'll have to square that in a moment. And then plus 4 times the input. So 4 times the binomial of t plus 2. And then lastly, there's that constant term of plus 1 at the end. So first we have to remember to foil out the binomial. Be careful here. It's not just a t squared and a 2 squared. We have to foil it out. That means t plus 2 times another t plus 2. So we'll still have the negative in front and we'll get a trinomial as a result. We get t squared plus 4t plus 4. I'll save the distribution for the next line, so we'll do it all at the same time. So now we're going to distribute the negative sign, and then we'll distribute the positive 4. So we have the opposite of t squared, the opposite of 4t, the opposite of 4. And then 4 times t is 4t, and 4 times 2 is 8. There's that constant term of 1 still hanging on at the end. Now we can combine like terms. We only have one term of a t squared, so that stays there. We have a negative 4t and a positive 4t that will cancel out. And then negative 4 plus 8 plus 1 is a positive 5. So when we have the function g and we plug in the t plus 2, with that's my input, here's my output. So the final topic that we're looking at here is what we call piecewise functions. Piecewise functions are functions. They're going to behave like functions, but they come in pieces, usually two pieces, but sometimes more. A piecewise function is defined by two or more equations over a specified domain. So in this little illustration here, there's the function notation on the left. There's the equal sign, which means we have inputs and outputs. But now we have two equations, but we can't use them both. Because if we use them both at the same time, that would give us two answers. And we don't want two answers, we want one answer. That means we only use the first equation or we only use the second equation. So how do we know which one to use? That's where the domain comes in. Remember, x is the symbol for input. So if my input is bigger than 2, I'll use this equation, x plus 2. However, if my input is less than or equal to 2, then I'll use the equation on the top, x squared. So you have to check your input first to see if it makes the top or the bottom domain a true statement. And then from there, you determine which equation that we're going to use. Let's do one example of this type. I'm going to the next page here, and we're looking at example 6, part b, and this one here. So here's my function notation. There's that single bracket. We have the equation on the top and the equation on the bottom. There's the comma separating that equation from the domain requirements. So this is saying we use the top equation only if our input is less than zero. Here, this is saying we use the bottom equation only if our input is greater than or equal to zero. So let's evaluate the function at negative one, at zero, and at one. So there's really three different uses of the same piecewise function. So let me just kind of spread it out here so we have room. So let's evaluate the function at negative 1. So that's the input, negative 1. But I have to figure out which equation to use, the top one or the bottom one. So we go to the domain side of the piecewise function and we check. We ask ourselves, is negative 1, my input, less than 0 
Why, yes it is. That means we're using the x squared plus 1. So I only have one equation to use. I'm not using both at the same time. You can double check here on the bottom domain requirement. You can say, is my negative 1 greater than or equal to 0? No, that's not true. So we don't use the x minus 1 on this problem. So plug in the negative 1 here for your input. And we get an output of 2. Now let's evaluate the piecewise function at 0. So again, we have to check the domain. Is my input of 0 less than 0? No, it is not. Is my input of 0 greater than or equal to 0? Yes, it is equal to 0, so that means we're using the equation of x minus 1. So again, notice we're only using one equation at a time. That way we only get one answer at a time. So there's the output of negative 1. Lastly, let's evaluate the piecewise function at positive 1. So we ask ourselves, is my input of positive 1 less than 0? No, it is not. Is it greater than or equal to 0? Yes, it is. So we use the x minus 1, and that output is the number 0.